if you add a lot of additional demand, you're going to see like really outsized upward price movement that then create the potential for a bubble. And I think bubbles are bad you know, in any industry. And it'll, the implication would be it could it could lead to additional regulation. If a bubble is burst, you'll have then you know the investigations like, hey, what happened? Why did Bitcoin go to you know 500,000 a coin then then retreat back to 100,000 a coin you'll have a bunch of unhappy investors a fresh regulatory look it's just a it's a bad idea to create a, a demand related bubble if you can avoid it all right guys bang bang i've got greg here with me uh greg you've got some very nuanced and unique thoughts when it comes to the macro environment most people in bitcoin and even in the gold world you know the world is ending uh go buy your asset today and prepare for hell tomorrow uh maybe it's not that simple and so help us walk through like how do you evaluate the macro economy and uh, specifically uh through the lens of people who are holding bitcoin yeah, so that that's a big part of the Bitcoin narrative is it's it's protection from the debasement of the dollar, and that's absolutely true. But that's a generational story. So you know when you do the math, and I've got you know thank Christian on my team to put all of this together for me today. Um, but hey, right now we've got like thirty four trillion in debt. That's that number has doubled since Bitcoin was invented, you know, in two thousand eight. Um, we are running a deficit of one to two trillion a year now, and like even so, that that we're we're on the top ten list of the most levered countries. Like the the next one up is number nine, Italy. You know, Greece is on that list. Venezuela, Sudan. It's not a list of heroes. Um, we we just got downgraded, you know, by Fitch, our, our current our uh, dollar, you know, government from AAA down to AA. So it's sort of it's happening. But even so, over the next ten years. Our debt's projected to only go to 50 trillion. Our economy is going to grow um, to you know to mid mid 40 trillion. Um, government receipts will still be there, so we're not like the currency isn't in trouble. So this isn't a rush to Bitcoin and a panic. But like, hey, make no mistake, we have a long term problem, but it's going to take a generation or two for that to play out. So and, and how does that play out? Well, hey, there'll come a day where the government will go and and sell try to sell bonds in the auction and they won't sell or they'll have to go back and and you know sell for a higher interest rate so like the the cracks in the foundation is you know represent themselves as hey right now we're taking our government takes in around you know four and a half trillion a year and interest is is more than a billion dollars or trillion dollars rather uh big big numbers um so it's 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 just not it's not a like a i'll still plead with our government, do not deficit spend. You know, I'm 52, we've had about four years in my lifetime and we haven't. Um, or at least if you can't do that, make sure that the economy is growing more quickly than the than the debt is growing. So that's, that is the, the way out of the mess is fiscal responsibility. But I think just given the political messes that we live in, you know, it's it doesn't seem probable. Like a Joe Biden is not going to be alive when the US debt crisis hits. So hey, he's incentivized to to keep spending. It's not gonna impact him. Um, hey, I'm 52, as I said, probably in my lifetime, we'll, we'll have a, a crisis. All of this, these deficit spends will cause a crisis. But I think if you're interested in Bitcoin, hey, this that's a long-term, you know, what I would describe as a generational issue. Um, and and it, it's happening. But I think the Bitcoin story works better for countries that are even less responsible than the U.S. You know, like I was in Egypt over the Christmas break. They're suffering with 35% inflation. Um, and I think they're more of the norm. So I think in a way, a, hey, while, yes, the U.S. is is failing, you know, our, our all the citizens by by deficit spending, Um Hey, we're we're sort of and we're on the top ten list of most levered, right? So we're not looking great, but it's not a crisis yet, like it is elsewhere. So it's a, uh, but I think hey, what's driving like the Bitcoin price? So I think every everyone you have on your show talks about like the the macro and the debasement of the currency, and that's true. But hey, this this is going to take a long time to play out, like decades and decades to play out before we have a a crisis related to. Uh, debasement. 
Um, when you when you wake up every morning, what are the things that you look at, either metrics or trends in the traditional financial system? So not Bitcoin or mining related, but like what are the things that you kind of check to see, hey, how are we doing today? And are things getting better or worse? Yeah. So hey, the things that are pushed on us are, hey, where is the stock market futures that up or down? Are we going to have an up or day down? You know, what what's pushed on us is what is the Fed doing? Well, the Fed ease, you know, and we all know the narrative. Hey, we we had them, you know, which they tend to do. They had we had multiple, you know, what seven raises, and quickly, you know, try to tamper down inflation. And actually, when you look back at at Fed behavior, that's how they normally do it. You know, they don't go twenty five basis points and wait a year to go another. They hit you pretty hard, and that's so they they behave like they normally do. If you looked at past uh, Fed actions. Um, and so now you're saying, hey, the the what we're being pushed on us is what will the Fed do? When will they ease? And obviously, then look at inflation data uh, that will then inform you know all of the the pundits for what the Fed is likely to do. Um, but hey, from I, I'm I'm running a a Bitcoin mining business, so I I can't help it but to look at Bitcoin, look at hash price. That's that's what most impacts uh, you know my day to day business. And. When you begin to think about uh, kind of this macro environment, um, we sitting in the United States tend to think of the U.S. economic situation. How much do you think the international markets or specific countries internationally where, you know, currencies are being debased at a faster rate, there's inflation rates that are measured in, you know, kind of high uh, two or even three figures, um, how much of it is a you know U.S. story versus maybe a internationally? This is a common problem that people are facing, and some are dealing with it better versus others. You know, I think the best way to answer that is to say that hey, we're still really in the early days of Bitcoin adoption and and use, and just the 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 utility of Bitcoin today is is it's more has more utility in countries that are debasing their currencies that are suffering with high inflation. Um, but the quantum of of dollars in our retirement system, um, and I'll, I'll go to an example of like of what I think the impact of the ETFs is likely to be, or BlackRock is likely to be on Bitcoin price. Um, but I, I would describe, hey, there are a, a myriad of issues that I would say are kind of ripples in, on the water, um, including yeah, countries like Egypt or you know Nigeria or pretty much you know. The the list is is long. Most countries have no choice but to print more than they they take in. Um, but that's that's just that's ripples on the water versus the wave of U.S. ETF money potential, the wave of U.S. retirement savings potential, and still just the relative scarcity of Bitcoin. So, like my example there is uh, sort of I guess going, hey, what will Bitcoin price do? And like my answer to that is, you know, as I said. It's a long wait to wait for the dollar to crash. We don't want it to crash anyway. It's not good for Bitcoin, not good for the world if the dollar doesn't do well. Um, so I, I can say Bitcoin can do well even if the dollar does well. Um, but in, in the short run, the wave is really related to Black, BlackRock. So they've got 17 billion now in their ETF. It's three, three only three months old. Um, we're about to have the halving, and the halving means we'll only be making as an industry uh, 450 coins per day. And that's that's that is the supply. So this is a there's a bunch of noise. At the end of the day, this is a supply demand problem. We're capped at 21 million coins, and we're only supplying 450 new ones a day. If BlackRock next month they go from 17 billion to 18 billion, that is more than 500 coins a day of additional demand from BlackRock alone. Um, so from what what I've heard and the way I would behave if I were them is to be very measured. It's like, hey, they are, they are going to end up with the biggest Bitcoin ETF. Grayscale is, is shrinking. BlackRock is growing. So they can rest easy knowing they have the, the market and managing almost 10 trillion. The, the size of their ETF growth should be measured, like they, meaning they shouldn't go out to all their clients and have a big push to try to create you know, 10 billion in a month of additional demand. That's, there isn't the supply. You know, we only see about what less than two million coins now trade on exchanges. I just don't know. The coins aren't available, right? So they're gonna, if they were to do that, they would by themselves cause a price bubble, hurt their own clients, 
probably have an egg on the face with the you know the regulator that that let the ETF through after almost you know 10 years. Um, and so if I think if you think about Bitcoin price in the short run, a, the wave is ETF capital and how these guys behave in terms of controlling their this the the spigot of demand because the supply is fixed and known. What do you think are the downsides if BlackRock, um, you know, kind of didn't slow play this? And slow play sounds hilarious when you say it's a three month fund with you know seventeen billion dollars in it. But in, in terms of maybe let's just talk about uh, you're an asset management firm. There's people knocking on the door. Obviously, you probably can slow play how much outbound sales and marketing and stuff you're doing. But like, what are the downsides if everyone just says screw it? I want as many assets as possible. And like, let you know, let's go. Yeah, I think I think because they're in a, the supply of Bitcoin isn't there, and those that have it, you know, those that are, that that have it trading on exchanges, that's obviously more liquid. If you if you added a lot of additional demand, you're going to see like really outsized upward price movement that then create the potential for a bubble. And I think bubbles are bad, you know, in any industry, and it'll the implication would be. It could it could lead to additional regulation if a bubble is burst you'll have then you know the investigations like hey what happened why did bitcoin go to you know five hundred thousand a coin then then retreat back to one hundred thousand a coin you'll have a bunch of unhappy investors that that participated in that um a fresh regulatory look it's just a it's a bad idea to create a, a demand related bubble if you can avoid it right and of course you have you know blackrock isn't the only etf I think many others are scrambling and doing their best to create uh, demand on their platforms, um, but it's just it is tough to compete with a, a the the largest asset manager in the world. So let's talk about miners. Obviously, the business that you guys are in on a day to day basis, and you probably think maybe the most about. Um, there's some similarities to what the asset managers have to think about. Like that cut from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 doesn't just affect the asset managers, doesn't just affect the investors. It also affects you all. And so how do you think today about kind of where miners are and, and what is the impact of the having coming up? Yeah. So, hey, we're, we're different than most miners in that we own our own power assets and own our own data centers. So I think if, if you're, and we call that vertical integration, I think other miners will own their, their mining fleet, might own their data center, might not, but the vast majority, on like may only, maybe only one or two others own their their power assets. And so if if that's your circumstance, like your revenue is about to be cut in half, because that's that's what the having means. The, the reward um, will, will go from 900 coins a day down to 450. Maybe we'll see a decrease in, in uh, in the number of people competing for those rewards. So we could see an increase in hash rate related to that. Um, we have an aside on, on hash rate in a, in a moment, um, but it really means you have two choices. One is you can upgrade your fleet by buying more efficient machines to get more hash rate out of your existing power supply, or you can try to drive your cost structure down as low as you can by lowering your cost of power. So this is, there, there aren't that many variables. So it's, it's really just two, as I said. So what we're thinking about is both. We're both working on ways to upgrade our fleet, to make it more efficient, to get more hash rate out of, out of our existing plugs. And then we are working on a variety of ways to drive down our cost of power. So in our model, um, we, are, we are in PJM. We own two plants in PJM. Interestingly, PJM has a, among the cheapest power and for the next two years. So if the price of power is so low, which it is right now, that we can buy the power from the grid cheaper than we can make it, we'll shut our plants down and buy that power from the grid. Um, in fact, it's it's cheaper than ERCOT for the next two years on average. So it's you know we are positioned to be one of the, the lowest cost miners just based on grid pricing. Um, if the cost of power is high, like so high, we can shut down the data center and sell power to the grid. So last year, you know, I was quite proud of our, ourselves. We we shut down the data center a few hundred times because the economic benefit to selling power to the grid was better than mining. Um, and then everywhere in between, we generally will you know will uh, run the data centers and either have the plants running or not. So 
the ways we can drive the cost of power down in, in our space, one is we have a very interesting carbon capture project that we announced um, late last year. And that's really a result of, of a, as a part of our process in making power, we are reclaiming waste that was left behind by hundreds of years of, of coal mining. It's the, the waste that was left on the surface is toxic. They're like 800 piles. I talked about this in, on that last time we met. Um, and it turns out that because we have to add, have to add crushed limestone to the, the fuel mix to take out the sulfur emissions that creates, um, an ash that is beneficial use ash. So you can use it, use it as fertilizer. It's non-toxic. Um, it has in it calcium oxide, which acts as a sponge in pulling carbon dioxide from the environment to create uh, calcium oxide. Um, so by weight, we can we can capture uh, uh, you know just slightly more than than ten percent by weight of of carbon from the air. So if we make you know hundred pounds of of ash, we can capture ten pounds of carbon dioxide through direct air capture as a result of the 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 carbon uh, sponge properties of the ash. So the net result is. We will end up with a, you know, as we roll this project out, it's going to lower our net cost of power. And in the Bitcoin mining space, the, the only, you know, you have Bitcoin price, you have hash price, um, and you have the cost of power. And that's really, and then you have the efficiency of your machines, and that will that will dictate what your margins will be. So we're pushing on, you know, cheaper, cheaper, lower emissions types of fuel. We're working on upgrading our fleet. And we're working on creative things like carbon capture, ultimately to lower our, our cost of, of power. How do you think about uh, capital allocators judging or, or kind of making a decision between, I, you know, I have $1, I can go buy Bitcoin Direct, I can buy the ETFs, I can buy uh, Coinbase or MicroStrategy and kind of like indirect exposure, levered exposure, uh, or I can yep. buy a, uh, a miner. And it's like, what do you think are the, the pros and cons of miners in those comparisons? Yeah, so a miner is going to have an an outsized benefit from Bitcoin price running than buying uh, on the, in the spot market or buying Bitcoin directly. So our, we'll have a lot more margin expansion um, with a higher hash price. So just as a you know, reminder for everyone, Bitcoin miners share the the mining reward among the whole group, and we all we pool our our hash rate. And then get our pro rata share of the work that we contribute to the pool. Um, and there's a big deal about you know the having, but in reality, the the hash, the amount of of hash rate globally, that's increased you know four or five times since the last having. So we're already we are already sharing the rewards. Um, you know they've been cut by a fourth or a fifth just by uh, a lot more miners competing for those rewards. So the the having is a you know yet another um, diminution in in sort of the the economics of mining. But it still it still works well because the hash price the Bitcoin price has gone up enough to make it a a worthwhile endeavor. Um, but I think if you were to believe that hey if you buy Bitcoin on the belief that it's going to go up, you will see more you know a a pretty dramatic margin expansion for the miners. That should lead to a an outsized uh, gain in in mining stocks versus what you just get from owning um, Bitcoin directly. And when you begin to think about, um, there's the block subsidy. There's also transaction fees, and at times we've seen that become pretty meaningful. Uh, yeah. At other times, it's been you know negligible. How do you think about? transaction fees moving forward and is that something that you can kind of model out and, and you know depend on as a business or is it more so that's like icing on the cake and hey if if fees spike uh it's great to have but we're not going to base our business on it yeah it's like looking backward that's how we've, we we've benefited from the the spikes that that occasionally happen um hey, but on a you know the future it will have more havings in it and so I think we're going to be driven to more efficiency, but transaction fees will become a bigger percentage of the, the economic offering for the work related to mining. Um, so I think it has to it has to be considered more in the future. But looking backward, it's not something that that I think most modeled in as a as a big contributor to margin. 
another topic that everyone seems to be very worried about or constantly talking about is the economic, uh, or I'm sorry, the environmental impact of miners. And uh, some of this is like, what power are you sucking in? Some of it is like, what are the emissions on the way out? Um, and then a whole host of things that, you know, my words, not yours, kind of made up concerns that frankly are just like a waste of everyone's time. But what, what do you think are maybe the uh, environmental topics that are important. And you're like, Hey, you know, actually we, we spend time thinking about these and we do think that they're fair things for, to, for us to be held accountable to. And then how do you think about, you know, maybe the areas where look, everyone's talking about this stuff, but, but we don't see it actually playing out. In Today's reality. episode is brought to you by core scientific. They are one of the largest public Bitcoin mining companies and hosting solutions in North America. They specialize in transforming energy into high value compute with exceptional efficiency at scale and recently announced a contract with core we, a leader in AI cloud compute, to provide up to 16 megawatts of data center capacity. With a substantial fleet of their own miners, Core Scientific not only earns Bitcoin for their own account, but also provides hosting services for large scale Bitcoin mining customers operating out of seven data centers in Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, North Dakota, and Texas. You can learn more about Core Scientific by visiting corescientific.com. That's corescientific.com. Go check them out today. Yeah, so I think I think first first off, if you looked at the at the top, you know, five or, or even ten miners in the world, the projected growth rates of hash rate imply another two and a half or three gigawatts of power need in the next like eighteen months to two years, and that's a that is a tremendous amount of power. You know, that's a uh, and my view is it's it's improbable that all the predictions of all the miners come true and they'll be adding the, that hash rate because it is it's a lengthy process to build data centers it's a lengthy process to get um things permitted and built and i think bitcoin miners are the best data center builders in the world the fastest the cheapest and so i think you know i think that's a that we'll probably see a you know a merge between those building these big data centers and and bitcoin miners at some point i think we've seen it a little bit already but that's that's part of the future um but i i would sort of flip the answer a little bit by saying hey we as a country we don't dictate the highest and and you know if if something's perceived to be bad for society we don't say well hey we're going to tax your power differently than we tax someone who's sort of good for society or deemed to be good for society Obviously, hey, those listening to your podcast probably believe that Bitcoin is good for the world and society. Um, but you know, hey, should we be taxing the power for data centers that run social media uh, servers um, or distilleries or casinos? I think it's a it's a dangerous thing to do to start to have the you know to 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 have government judge who they say is good and bad and then charge a different rate for power. Um, it's a free market system, and you know the, those that 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 want to uh, participate in buying power from the grid, that's a a good thing. And I think that those that are making power have benefited from the build out of of the demand from from Bitcoin, a benefit from, from the continued build out in data centers that are you know that's that's one of the biggest growth businesses in the in the country now is the build out of data centers like unrelated to Bitcoin. Um, but Bitcoin is different in that it's decentralized. So I think if you were to call Google and say, hey, Google, we want to build your data center. Do you mind if if it cycles off a few hundred times a year to benefit the stability of the power grid and to help suppress pricing in the grid? And they would say, no, I, I want to use the power regardless of price all the time because, you know, my customers don't want to have intermittent service. Um, Bitcoin miners can easily stomach intermittent intermittently turning off the data center. So like we turned off one of our data centers a few hundred times last year in response to high grid pricing. Texans, I think, do it even more often than that. Uh, you know, I was with one of my, you know, peer CEOs last week. Uh, and he said he, he I bragged about 200 times as, hey, how about a thousand times? And so the effect of cycling uh, a data center, even you know, you don't have to take it to dark. Just put the miners in efficient mode, um, or put them in a sleep mode so they're not like rapidly cooling and degrading the equipment. Um, 
The impact of that is the grid, even upon just a price response, will end up being much more stable if it can if that grid has has access to to instantly, you know, 50 or 100 megawatts from a data center cycling down. Um, and it's 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 not talked about enough, but the impact of solar and wind, which are both intermittent sources of power, it's a, a I'm for it. It's greening the planet. That's that's a you know it's heavily subsidized, but it's still you know uh, a, a carbon free source of electricity. Um, to make a a to make the grid function like it functioned with a baseload fossil fuel. You need a like a grid scale battery, and grid scale batteries are dirty. They don't last long. They're dangerous because they, if they catch fire, how are you going to put that out? Um, and they only last a couple hours. And so I, I think a, you know, w- without thanks and even without any really recognition, Bitcoin miners are already acting like grid scale batteries, and the grid can't tell the difference. All the grid knows is hey, we had a a spike in the price. And all that within seconds, a lot more power became available. And that's what would happen with a battery. And that's what Bitcoin miners are doing. And it's stabilizing the grid. And that's to the benefit of, of society in the form of lower power prices. Because they, we're, we respond to those prices when we supply that power to the grid. Um, and it also isn't talked about like a much bigger impact than Bitcoin mining on the price of power for consumers is the forcing of renewable energy onto the grid that it's just it's it is it's not when people say hey solar's on power on par with with like natural gas in terms of of cost um well it's not because it's not apples to apples for you to to you know if you for you to to recreate a 100 megawatt power plant in the solar world you would need a giant battery and probably a you know a gigawatt of power to feed the battery to run at night when the sun isn't shining. So like we've been fed a, a story that's apples and oranges, but I think that the tell is that if you looked at the most renewable heavy grids in the world, they are also the most expensive power in the world. And that's just because you need effectively two grid, you need two sources of power. So you're doubling your base and it, it results in, in, in the more extensive power pricing. So like a answer is really a, hey, we're, we're already a solution for a problem that we have created by the in, introduction of these intermittent sources. So what Bitcoin mining can be an intermittent user and an intermittent curtailer. And I, I, I hope that that's how we can be viewed because that's, that's a way to prevent you know, we're going to get more brownouts and blackouts the more solar and wind you add. And so I think you really ought, you want, you want to have Bitcoin mines in, in those areas where you have a lot of solar and wind. It'll help stabilize the, the marketplace. Another aspect is um, carbon and being carbon negative. Talk a little bit about how you all see kind of the environmental component around carbon uh, kind of ingested. Yeah, so I think we we clean up um, waste piles. So here's what happened. So before 1975, coal miners could they would they would mine the coal, bring it up from beneath the surface. They the good coal, they would take and turn it into power or use it to make steel. And the marginal quality stuff, which is about 30 or 40 percent of what came up beneath the surface, was left on the surface, and that is highly pollutive. It's it's having sulfur, you know, mercury, all the the cancer co- the truly cancer causing stuff, um, is is left on the surface that that is causing a massive amount of groundwater and and pollution in Pennsylvania, which is our our biggest sort of coal mining state, um, and there is no you know the youngest of these piles is about fifty years old now, so there is no other solution to clean them up, if you leave them as they are. The methane emissions, um, which are, you know, methane emissions are multiples of of carbon uh, in terms of greenhouse gas effect. It's, you know, up to 50 times more impactful than carbon when released into the air. 
So leaving them on the surface is a greenhouse gas plus like of the 800 piles, maybe more than 50 of them are on fire right now. So they're burning, you know, without emissions control. So we we are carbon negative versus leaving the piles in their current state as they are. Um, so we we go in with, you know, we partner with the Pennsylvania DEP to identify these sites. We get grants to clean them up. Uh, we earn renewable energy credits to, you know, when we create the power as a part of the the uh, the benefit to clean up the piles, we we get that. Um, and so, yeah, our our, our carbon negative um, role is really just a result of the waste that we're cleaning up being so bad that it still makes sense to burn it with emissions controls than it does to leave it on the surface. And that's 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 not including the benefit to the communities when they you know right now, you know you'll go to a, a neighborhood and they'll have a you know a row of houses backing up to a you know a hundred acre waste site. It's just it's not a uh, it's not kind. The mine is gone, the companies are gone, and the state is left to to clean up the mess. And so that's that's really what we're what we are are tasked with doing. Um, and we have a purpose-built facility. This is not a thermal coal plant, so what, what, the things that we run. These are purpose, purpose-built plants specifically designed to clean up this legacy problem. And we've got like another 15 or 20 years left and all the stuff will be cleaned up. So you know, if we end up you know, not doing it, I think this, this waste will be here and the water pollution, air pollution will be here for another you know, 500 years. It's just, there's no other way to do it. Do you guys get incentivized to do the cleanup or is it pretty much, uh, hey, we, there's like a, a market force that incentivizes you by it's cheaper or, or more efficient or something? Yeah. So the, yeah, the market force is we, we, um, we sell the power into the market or use it to convert to Bitcoin. Um, we get renewable energy credits, which is a market-based system that Pennsylvania set up, but that's still a system that if, you know, if, if government didn't create the system, then they wouldn't get that benefit. And we get a small benefit um, just on per ton for, for cleaning up the waste. But I'd say hey, the big benefit is, is to the communities. Like I think you can go to our website, you'll see the before and after pictures. And you sort of, you know, they're ashamed that this country industrialized and left what we left behind. Um, so it's important that we that we clean up the mess. Now, talk a little bit about um kind of Bitcoin and um, the amount of Bitcoin you're able to mine based on the current hardware. And it seems like every couple of years, hardware and machines and even the software that, you know, it's kind of run, yeah. uh, we get these like efficiency uh, and innovative gains. Yeah. Should we expect that to continue? Is there some sort of like mental model you all use when thinking about, you know, hey, here's the fleet we have today. How often are we going to have to replace this? What does that cost look like? Just how do you kind of think of cap allocation when it comes to uh, the hardware and the fleet? That's a great question. So right now we're running about four exahash. If we were to replace our fleet with um, brand new machines that are the most efficient that have a higher hash rate per you know uh, power used, we could be at seven exahash. So that's that's sort of our our potential in today's terms. And of course, I think it, I would expect efficiency gains to continue. Um, as long as it's a, as long as mining stays an economic business like it is today. Um, and as I said, hey, the other way to make the same money is to just drive your cost down. So like if you, I think if there's a surprise coming to the market, it's if you looked at where mining is likely to go, it's in my view, it's likely to go in jurisdictions where power is cheap, you know, energy is abundant um, and, jurisdictions where people are looking to get out of dollar dominance um that would be a popular thing to do so like hey, hey well we're going to find out that russia has been been mining and growing their mining activity i would be surprised if the answer is no you know i think they're um i i hear like china has has quietly you know started to add mining again even though it's it's banned um the middle east i think it's it's known publicly that they're growing, you know, mining activities. And that, that's not a, we should not be surprised by any of those. So I think it's a, um, I would expect, you know, global hash rate to continue to grow, including in places outside the U.S. 
Now, when you look at those places, are there geopolitical concerns or should we want um, competition? And I go back to it. One point, China had you know sixty percent of hash rate. Uh, I think people are like, "Ah, it's China. They have sixty percent. We don't like that." They kind of self-inflicted wound. A bunch of people unplugged the machines. Now the U.S. has you know upwards of thirty, thirty-five plus percent, ten percent in Texas. Like, could the U.S. have too much hash rate? You know, if we got to fifty or sixty percent in the U.S., would that be concerning? Um, and how do you just think maybe about the geographic both competition and also you know partnership of a distributed or decentralized system not being too concentrated anywhere. Yeah, so hey, it's obviously it's important that it stay decentralized. That's part that that is the you know the the key to the attractiveness of Bitcoin is it's the, it is the largest decentralized network in the world. Um, I, I still hey, as as much as we all criticize sort of the the U.S., we still have the best capital markets in the world. We still have rule of law here. In, even if it, in New York, it occasionally takes a a detour. Um, but I don't I don't think that that a concentration of mining in the U.S. would would constitute a threat to the network. Um, uh, so I, I I would not be you know in spite of what you know the occasional letter from senators that we all get. Um, I don't I don't predict a uh, a ban on mining here. Um, or a, the, and there is no like imminent um, tax that that would would cause mining to be unattractive in the U.S. And I don't think that would change. Um, but I, I think it's it is because it's a a truly global um, store of value, and we want to see, you know, I'd like to see activity of use in Bitcoin and. Or, you know around the world i think it's it's good for adoption good for awareness um and i think you can also benefit other power grids um you know i think i was uh like I, I saw a preview of a movie called dirty coin i don't know if you've seen that one yet um they're, they're mining in africa and using the sort of excess power at night um is what's subsidizing like micro grids or African communities that wouldn't get access to that power otherwise. Um, so yeah, obviously that that's a relatively small component, but and and you, you obviously have heard about you know stranded gas being converted to Bitcoin or being converted to electricity than Bitcoin. So that's a global thing. So I, I I'm for a, a global product, global awareness, global utiliz utilization. Um, and I think it's generally good for the ecosystem. And then what are the areas that maybe people are not talking about in mining, but you think are really important? They could be internal operations. They could be, you know, how these companies are being funded today, or it could even just be like market developments over the next 12 months that, you know, you want to wave a flag and say, Hey, everyone pay attention to this, even though you're not yet. Yeah. So obviously the, it's the allocation of capital question. It's do you, you know, I, I think there probably isn't quite enough transparency with the public market as to hey is it a good investment to buy a new machine or is it a better or is it better to to have the old one run with lower margin like what's the real return on on capital that we have um that we can, that we can achieve in this business um i guess going back to the 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 predictions for what people are are expected to grow in the next couple of years, you know, to add almost three gigawatts of power, that that's that's going to take, you know, it's 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 a five to ten billion dollar investment for the industry to grow as it's as it's projecting it's going to grow, and that's between power, data centers, new machines, um, and I guess the you know what what I'd like to see, you know, for all of us miners is just the proof that hey this is a good return on capital um does it make sense to use you know internally generated cash flow to buy those machines or should you issue more stock to buy the machine should you issue debt like what's the best way to to grow um i think uh, a few guys are sort of growing for growth's sake and being silent on whether or not this is a 
a positive return on on invested capital. And so I think that's what I would hope to see is hey, just the discipline. Um, hey, capital can be scarce. And I think, you know, discipline and transparency is is what I would hope we can see. Talk a little bit about um tokenization, which I know is something that you you've thought about. Um AI took the you know, kind of center stage after crypto had 2020, 2021, AI kind of got 2022, 2023. But you think that Bitcoin plus uh, some of the work that's going on in tokenization could potentially br- bring back uh, the spotlight? You know what? It, that's that's right. I, I I thought that. And then and, and BlackRock had yet another announcement on sort of a tokenization fund. And like we're going to see like the low hanging fruits, like, hey, who doesn't want to buy a minority share of a sports team? Like, you know, sports fans that's that's easy um who doesn't want to buy a you know a a tokenized portfolio of real estate or aviation leases like any financial project uh that that uh can be securitized can be tokenized but like even beyond that like when i you know my first job was at goldman sachs in, in 1993 and the big theme of that like the annual uh employee get together was derivatives. That's what, you know, all the bankers were said, hey, here's what a derivative is. And your clients may not know that they need it, but you know, they if they want to hedge a certain risk, they can Goldman can could then create a new product for just that that client and will sell, you know, break out the risk and sell to a different client. And Goldman being in the middle could sort of create a new market. Um I really view tokenization as the next step in how to make derivatives available while really shrinking the role of the middleman. And so like these example that would be like I think the first insurance company to say hey I want to I want to go underwrite a you know a here's here's a basket of insurance risks and I want to sell that to the to the public or to other investors tokenize it because you can then, you know, the insurance company will say, "Hey, here's the here's the product." They'll essentially be the they would have been the underwriter. They can make their fee for underwriting, but the, the insurance company does, doesn't even need to own that risk anymore. They can tokenize it and and share it, and there can be a return for that. So I think I think we're going to see like the low hanging fruit of things that can be securitized to be easily tokenized. But I'm ex- I'm actually more excited about the coming change to. You know, what I think will be almost every industry for what it can mean to get access to less friction um, once you do a deal underwriting, um, which I would say is just next generation derivative transactions without the middleman. That's that's what I think, you know, and that'll that'll be a a 20 year benefit to and evolution of the, you know, fintech. So I think it's yeah. As you, I'm sort of disappointed to say, hey, we sort of crypto had its moment in the sun for about you know an hour and a half, but it's far from like that excitement is not misplaced. It's gonna, it's still gonna show up in industry. The um, beauty of Bitcoin is that it was adopted by individuals first, then kind of you know financial organizations, corporations, eventually nation states. Um, do you think tokenization follows the same path or is it more top down where you need the financial organizations to do things that either are more, you know, kind of financial uh, or they are more um, regulated? You know, the easy way is would have to be top down, right? So, and and I think there'll be margin for the first mover, but hey, once the first mover happens, like in insurance, in my example, everyone else is going to be required to do the same thing because it's it's going to impact cost of capital and that insurance is a cost of capital business um and so it, it's I, I think we'll have uh in this in this instance which i know is different than than you know traditional crypto it really it can be easily dominated by incumbents that i think we'll find a a good reason to enhance margins for doing this it's just a you know when, when the first guy goes in the industry It'll be a race. And then when you think of your company and, and kind of the team and, and how you all are positioned, when you talk to folks, like what, what are the things that you think give you an advantage in the market? Or, or you say, hey, look, this is where we really think we've got like this wedge or advantage and, and we're going to try to exploit this throughout this bull market. Yeah, so that's a great question. So hey, we're, 
we're the only vertically integrated one of scale. And so a we're right right now at one plant, we have it, we have it idled while we're buying power from the grid because power is so cheap. The other plant, we're making power cheaper than we can can buy it. So we're, you know, we have that that arbitrage to make. So I think we're the most effective um power pricing arbitrage vehicle of the miners that makes us different. I think we have yeah uh, unfortunately I think the market is really just valued you know scale and growth rate more than 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 that ability. So I think we've you know we we have not uh benefited from a stock price standpoint like we we think we should have. I think I think people don't really understand our asset or a model as well as uh as we'd love them to. Um, but I think as a market, hey, there, there are more than 20 publicly traded Bitcoin miners today. And my expectation is that post having, we're going to see consolidation. So it's a, um, you'll have those, you know, being public is an expensive, uh, way to go, you know, as, as an enterprise. Um, so to the extent you can see consolidation and synergies between companies, I think I would expect to see that this year. And then if we look back, I don't know, maybe in three to five years and you guys execute how you you know plan to execute, what does that look like in terms of uh, market dynamics? Is there a lot of consolidation in the industry and, and you guys would eventually look to kind of buy up other firms as part of that consolidation? Maybe you don't think there'll be consolidation like, like you know, you get credit and we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You're going to do everything you say you guys are going to do and, and your roadmap and everything executes perfectly. How do you interact with the rest of the market? Yeah. So if if we if we execute well, we're going to drive our costs of power to to the, you know, to a, a super low point where it'll be it'll be clear that even with, with less efficient machines, that we'll end up with a a uh, better margins than what's possible elsewhere without having to constantly reinvest new capital in in more efficient machines. So that's that that's the so that's that's the best thing we can do is drive our cost of, of power down. Which if we have a carbon capture project we're doing to do that. As I said, we're working on new fuels that can also have that same impact. And so I think that's the our best way to execute, which is different than others is we have the ability and, and levers to drive our cost of power down, um, given that we make it ourselves. So that, that, that would be a, an achievement. And, and with that, hey, we probably will continue to upgrade the fleet. I think it, it just makes sense to, um, to push on that front as well. Got it. Where can we send people to find out more about uh, you, about Stronghold and, and what you guys are doing? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn, Greg Beard. And Stronghold Digital Mining has a website that has a bunch of great case studies and uh, all of our, you know, publicly um, public information as well. So yeah, please have a look. The the uh, one thing I will say is if people go to the website, uh, the videos are pretty cool in terms of the communities. I think there, if I remember correctly, there's one where it's like a reclaimed site, and there's been uh, uh, soccer, football fields, and baseball fields, and then there's some that are uh, it appears like the vegetation is growing back, all, all this stuff, and so pretty cool to kind of hear what you guys are doing and, and the thought process, but then actually see it visually in photos. Uh, uh, I remember saying, "Wow, that that's uh, pr pretty just awesome to see that happening in a community." No, thanks. Now it's thousands of acres cleaned up. So I'm, I'm really proud of the, you know, it, the we're really a reclamation business um, coupled to the Bitcoin mining business. And, you know, and they both are, are very important activities for us. Awesome. Well, Greg, thank hey, you so much. Way, congratulations to your big announcement today. I'll be uh, <laughs> looking forward to, uh, you know, more more of, of your, your thoughts and what you come up with uh, on a daily basis. So thank you. I appreciate it very much. We'll definitely do this again in the future. Yep, you bet. Thank you.